I'm Jill Morricone, and I just want to welcome you to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. We love this time. We get to open up the Word of God study with you at home and with our 3ABN family around the panel. Speaking of that, I want to introduce them to you. To my left, Pastor Terry Shelton. You're the head elder, first elder, of the Thompsonville Seventh-day Adventist Church, and we're so delighted to have you here. Thank you, Jill. It's very, um, very happy to be here. It's a pleasure, honor for me to join the rest of you in the Sabbath School program today. And you're, you're doing Monday's lesson. What's your title? I Will Come Again. Yay. To your yeah. left, Pastor John Denzi. And what are you doing, Pastor? I am doing Tuesday, I Will Raise Him Up. Yay. Mm -hmm. To your left, my sister, Shelly Quinn. Glad to have you here, too. Oh, it's a joy. And mine is at the sound of the trumpet. Amen. Last but not least, our singer in Israel, Evangelist <laughs> Ryan Day. Delighted you're here. Always a blessing to be a part of the 3B and Sabbath School panel. And I have Thursday's lesson, and Everla The Everlasting Encounter. Amen. I'm looking forward to what the Lord is going to share through each one of you Amen. and through His Word. Before we go any further, we want to go to the Lord in prayer. Shelley, would you pray for us? Oh, yes. Father, we come in the name of Jesus approaching you now to ask that, Lord, send your Holy Spirit to be our teacher. We thank you for your Word. We know it is sure Word. And Lord, we ask that you would give us ears to hear mm -hmm. and eyes to see what your Bible truths are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Lesson number eight, the New Testament hope. We're talking this week about the hope you and I have, we have mm -hmm. as Christians. Since Christ was resurrected, we have hope of eternal life. This world is not all there is. Jesus is coming again. Yeah. The New Testament writers, the lesson brings us out on Sabbath's lesson, that the New Testament writers, except for Luke, of course, were all Jews and they approached the nature of humanity from the Hebrew holistic approach, not from the pagan Greek perspective. What I mean by that, the Old Testament and the New Testament clearly do not teach that we're two separate entities. We've been discussing this the entire lesson that some Christians, some people, and this comes from that pagan Greek concept, some people teach that the body, the shell, dies, but the spirit or the soul lives on somehow through eternity or goes to heaven or into some sort of purgatory. The Word of God, as we've discovered these last lessons, does not teach that. We saw in the Old Testament that the body, the dust, when it was formed, God formed Adam of the dust of the ground, plus the breath equals a soul. And we know that the soul that sins will die, does not continue in immortality, but dies. When we um, die, the, the breath returns to the God who gave it, but we simply rest in that unconscious state until the resurrection. What an incredible gift. We know our memory text. This is 1 John 5, 11 and 12. This is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. Amen. And this life is in His Son. What does that mean? There is no eternal life apart from having a saving relationship with Jesus Amen. Christ. Only those in Christ have eternal life. Christians have hope because Jesus was raised from the dead. He who has a son has life. He who does not have the son does not have life. So it would behoove us to have the Son Amen. and to accept Amen. Jesus as our personal Savior. On Sunday, we look at hope beyond this life. <coughs> We're going to 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to look at verses 12 through 19 for my portion. This is 1 Corinthians 15. You can turn there with me. I want to ask you a question. Why does the resurrection of Jesus matter? Why does it matter? If there was no resurrection, the gospel would be meaningless. Forgiveness of sins would be hopeless. Present life would be joyless. Godly living would be fruitless. And future life would be worthless. If there was no resurrection, there is no gospel. If there's no gospel, there's no forgiveness of sins. If there's no forgiveness of sins, we are. Ah, do not have present joy. We are of all people right. most miserable. There is no future hope. So let's look at this. Why does the resurrection of Jesus matter? 
Where would we be without hope in a hereafter? Where would we be without that hope mm -hmm. of eternal life? The ancient Greek historian, this is Herodotus, this was 5th century BC. He wrote about a tribe that began, get this, a period of mourning when a baby was born. Hmm. So when a new baby was born in the tribe, they began a period of mourning because they anticipated the suffering that the baby would experience as it grew up into adulthood. And we think, wow, that's pretty serious. There was right. an advertisement in America in the 20th century. It said, why live if you can be buried for $10? Mm. Wow. Do Christians suffer? They do. Mm -hmm. We know that the rain falls on the just and on the unjust. We know that trials come to those who serve God, and trials also come to those who do not serve God. Do Christians die? Yes, they do. Christians die in car accidents and cancer. Christians die in civil war and genocides. Christians are murdered and martyred. Christians are raped and brutalized. Christians suffer with famine and disease. And you say, wait a minute, then why would I be a Christian? If Christians experience the same things that those who are not Christians experience, Christians do not sorrow, do not struggle as those who have no hope. Because you see, this world is not all there is. We have the presence of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 13 verse five, he says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. We have the promise of the joy of Jesus. Psalm 16, verse 11, in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So if we have his presence, we will have his joy. And if we have his joy, we have his strength. Nehemiah eight ten, the joy of the Lord is your strength. We also have hope in the hereafter. This is 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith, for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. When you look at that and you study the word of God, if you're a Christian, you have so much more than if you suffer a trial or encounter a trial without having Jesus yeah, in right. the midst mm -hmm, of right. that. Why does the resurrection of Jesus matter? We're going to our scripture. This is 1 Corinthians 15. We're gonna pick it up in verse 12 and I have six takeaways for you in this section. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how does some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? I love Paul's logic. Mm -hmm. You know that? Right. The, the progression <laughs> of logic that Paul has here. What is he saying? If Christ is raised from the dead, how could you be saying that there's no resurrection of the dead? Because if Jesus is raised, then other people have to be as well. Mm -hmm. Verse 13, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. So that's the flip side of the logic. Well, clearly if there's no resurrection, then Christ would not have been able to be risen either. Takeaway number one, our resurrection would be hopeless without the resurrection of Christ. Believing that Christ was resurrected means also believing that the dead will be raised at Christ's second coming. The two concepts are inseparably linked because he was resurrected, we have hope that one day at the second coming of Jesus, we also will be resurrected in the first resurrection, the resurrection of the righteous. Let's look at verse 14. If Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty mm -hmm. and your faith is also empty or your faith is in vain, the King James says. The NIV says, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. And so is your faith. Takeaway number two, the gospel is meaningless without the resurrection of Christ. There's no point in even preaching if Christ had not been resurrected. You know, there's no point, no. Faith is only as good as its object. Amen. I wanna say that again. Your faith is only as good as the object in which your faith resides. Mm -hmm. Let me give you an illustration. What if I were to say my car 
can fly. I have faith my car can fly. I believe it. I truly mm -hmm. have faith. Does that mean my car is going to fly? Absolutely not. What if I were to say I'm going to drive 80 miles an hour over the rim of the Grand Canyon and I'm going to prove to you that my car flies? What's going to happen? Mm. It's going to crash. My car is going down. Why? Because the object of that faith is not very good. Mm. It didn't matter if I had faith, but the object wasn't good. What is the difference with us as Christians? There is no point in having faith if there's no resurrection of Christ. Amen. So the object of our faith is in Jesus, his perfect life, his substitutionary death, and his, most importantly, for this study, his resurrection. Let's look mm -hmm. at verse 16. If the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. If there is no future resurrection, then what we preached about Jesus would be false. Amen. Takeaway number three, our eternal life is hopeless without the resurrection of Christ. Verse 17, if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. We'd still be separated from God. Mm -hmm. That means 2 Corinthians 5, 19 never happened. What does that say? That says God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. And it's committed to us the reconciliation, the word of reconciliation. Well, what does that mean? That means if Christ had not risen, that never even took place. Right. Remember, Jesus came to bridge the gap between my sin and the holiness of God. He came to offer his perfect sacrifice as in my place. He stood in my place. But if he did did not raise from the dead. Takeaway number four, the forgiveness of sins is pointless without the resurrection of Christ. Mm -hmm. Verse 18, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. This is all the people who have died in Christ, believing in hope, believing in that promise of resurrection. If Christ had not been resurrected, they would have actually died the second death already. Mm -hmm. There would be no hope of resurrection for them. Takeaway number five, hope beyond the grave is worthless without the resurrection of Christ. And finally, verse 19, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable or of all people most pitiable. Takeaway six, suffering in this life is purposeless without the resurrection of Christ. Where would we be without hope in Jesus? Where would we be without faith in him? Where would we be with the promise that he is coming again? I'm so grateful that Jesus rose from the dead and we have that promise. Amen. Amen. Thank you. That was really good. Well, I was given um, lesson eight, um, Monday's lesson, I will come again. And I was really happy when I saw that um, it begins with John 14, 1 to 3, because that happens to be my most favorite passage in all of Scripture. And I hope that you know it. John 14, 1 to 3. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. Yeah. I love those passages yes. and um, I, I have loved that for years. The lesson starts off by asking a question. It's been 2000 years and Jesus still hasn't returned. Mm. Why is this promise still relevant today? Well, let me ask you a question, friend. Is God a man that he should lie, mm. right? It tells us, tells us that in Numbers 23 and verse 19. God doesn't lie. Jesus doesn't lie. And so if they said it, you can take it to the bank. We are closer. I believe this. I don't know about the rest of you. I believe that we are closer to, to the second coming of Jesus than ever before. Mm -hmm. Do you at home, do you believe that? Take a look at this world. Just look at what is happening, what is going on in our world today. And we know that something big is coming. Yes. And, um, for those of us who believe in that coming, we know what that big event is. Yes. Every day that comes and goes, we are one day closer to that great event. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're a believer of the word, you know that 
I believe that symbolically in heaven, there's a countdown timer going on, mm -hmm. <laughs> at least in the mind of God, right? There's this timer that's, that's counting down one day and one day, one day. And one of these days, that timer is going to reach zero. Yeah. Um, we don't know when that day is coming, but we know that it is coming. Why do we know it is coming? Because he said so. And we, we can believe that. In the book of Revelation, it's pointed out by our lesson that Jesus says, I am coming again four times. Is that important? Yes. Yes, it is. In fact, in one place he said, I'm coming quickly. Um, the expectation of the New Testament church was that he would be coming back in their lifetime. And this is why they work so feverishly to spread the gospel to every part of the globe. But unfortunately, that wasn't to be. It wasn't coming in their lifetime or in the generations that soon followed the New Testament believers. And now we find ourselves waiting. And we've been waiting for so long that, you know, some people are saying, uh, this is not really going to happen. This is, this is just a big yeah. myth. This is a fairy tale. You ever heard, heard anybody say that the Bible is a fairy tale? Mm -hmm. I have. And, and, and Peter prophesied that people would say this. He, uh, is, it records in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 4. They would say, where is the promise of mm. his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Previous to that verse, it calls them scoffers. Scoffers would come. Um, so from a human standpoint, it does seem like that there has been a delay. But has there been a delay? Mm. The Apostle Paul wrote in the book of Romans chapter five and verse six, that in due time, mm. Christ died for the ungodly. You hear that? In due time. That's right. You see, God has a timetable. He has a timetable and it's not the same as our timetable. Not mine, not yours, not anyone watching. God has a timetable and his timetable is perfection. So we must ask the question, well, what is God waiting on? Yeah. The Bible gives, gives us one answer, which is found in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, where it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Mm, yep. You see, God is waiting for as many people as possible to come and get in that ark of safety while there is still time. Mm -hmm. Are you praying for people to get in the ark of safety? I know that I am every day. We pray for people, please God, help them to get in the ark while there is still time. And even now the final test is yet to come upon us. And that means that People are still in the valley of decision. Mm -hmm. Am I going to accept this? Mm -hmm. Am I going to reject it? Uh, today it seems nice, tomorrow I'm not so <laughs> sure, you know. People are in the valley of decision about whether they're going to believe everything that is written in this book or mm -hmm. not. Um, I think there's another reason why, uh, as the question is asked, why is John 14, 1 to 3 so relevant? Because let's say that Jesus doesn't return for 200 years mm -hmm. or even 100 years or 50 years. Mm -hmm. We won't be here to see that, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. As we read in the book of Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27, it is appointed for men to die once. <laughs> yes. Every one of us are headed for that grave if Jesus continues to, to tarry. And... Um, all of our lives, our, our lives, it's all that we have. And when we take our last breath here on planet Earth, we have no knowledge of the passing of time. And the second coming of Jesus is never, never more than a moment or two away from that perspective. You know, friends, probably throughout this whole COVID pandemic and everything that we have come through in the last couple of years, we have seen many of our loved ones pass on, pass into the grave. But many people are dying today. And I think it's safe to say they had no clue that that was coming. Mm, Someone taken tragically in an accident on the, on the highway, someone in, in, in a fire, in a plane crash or whatever. They have no knowledge that that was coming upon them. And yet, if we understand the Bible correctly, we understand that when we fall asleep, that's it. That's it. And we are waiting for one of two possible resurrections. Friends, it doesn't matter when Jesus returns. 
What matters is that he does return. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we can count yeah. on that. You know, I think about the long suffering and the patience of God. He has been waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. I did a study one time on um, the promise to Abraham to give him the land of, of what would be known Israel at that time. And, you know, Abraham received this promise from God and yet it didn't really come to fruition until like 400 and something years later. Again, God has a timetable. It's not our timetable, but God knows what he's doing. And when the fullness of time has come, Jesus came, right? Jesus came as a baby when the time had come. Right. And he will come again when the time has come. What is our part? Our part is to be, be, ready. be ready, to be faithful, mm -hmm. to be telling others this time is coming. Again, I say, look at the world around you. The, the, the natural disasters that are happening, the, the, the crime and the violence that we see mm -hmm. going on in our world today, it seems to be more rampant than ever before. Something big is occurring. Something big is about to happen. And we know what that is. It is that Jesus Christ is coming again. I hope that those of you watching today are, are, are looking for that day with anticipation. I hope that you are counting on his promises when he says, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Why is he coming again? Because he wants to take us with him. He wants to be with us. Right. You know, he wants us to experience that life that he has waiting for us, it'll be a shame to miss out. Mm -hmm. It'll be a shame to miss out. You know, sometimes we talk about, sometimes we as Christians, we talk about this, this judgment that's coming and this, this fire, and we'll, we'll study that in a later, a later lesson, this fire that's coming and this judgment and everything. But you know, I remember being a child and I got invited to a birthday party one time and I got in trouble and I wasn't able to go to the birthday party. Now, was, was staying home the punishment? Well, no, but really because I'm home all the time. The punishment was that I didn't get to go to the birthday right. party. Mm -hmm. Oh, friends, it'd be a shame to miss out on yeah. all that God has prepared and is waiting for us mm -hmm. simply because we had doubts, simply because we listened to our, our family member, or our close friend saying it's a myth, it's a fairy tale. Search the scriptures for yourself and see whether these things be true. Mm -hmm. God has a timetable and he is coming and he has a life prepared for you like you cannot imagine. One of my other favorite verses is from the writings of Paul. I have not seen, mm -hmm. neither ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for those that love him. Friends, don't miss out. Don't miss out on this second coming of Jesus and be ready when he comes. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Pastor Terry. We want to be ready. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Welcome back to our study on the New Testament hope. We're going to kick it over to Pastor John Denzi in Tuesday's lesson. Thank you so much. Tuesday's lesson has the title, I Will Raise Him Up. And this is taken from John chapter 6, which we will look at in a moment. In John chapter 6, it begins with the story of Jesus feeding over 5,000 people mm -hmm. with some bread and a little bit of fish. <laughs> and these people uh, saw this miracle and they wanted to make him king. And Jesus perceiving this, he separated himself. But the next day, the people were looking for him and they found him. And that's when Jesus begins to talk to them that he is the bread of life. Mm -hmm. Let's go ahead and go into John chapter 6 now, uh, beginning in verse 26. Uh, let's, uh, Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves mm -hmm. and were filled. Mm -hmm. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. 
So we have here a message. Now, Jesus said, do not labor for the food which perishes. Uh, in, in other words, don't set your highest priority mm. on getting food and getting things. You know, we do have to work mm -hmm. in order to uh, get food, to bring food to our tables. But Jesus said, don't make this your highest priority. Right. In fact, there are other places you see, Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. But Jesus talks about a food which endures unto everlasting life. Mm -hmm. What food is that? It says that he is the one that will give us that food. So we need to seek him, Jesus Christ. So here is when they say in verse 28, then they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? Good question. But were they ready for the answer? Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. Mm. Mm. And these people uh, apparently did not have their priorities set correct. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is, is, is struggling to bring this message to them to help them understand that their focus is on the wrong thing. In John chapter 6, Jesus presents uh, the bread of life and he also talks about what happens uh, for the righteous when they die and when they participate in following Jesus. So here, uh, here we go in verse 30. They said, therefore, they said to him, what sign will you perform <laughs> then? You see, seeking for miracles, seeking for uh, things that will bring them excitement, that we may see it and believe you. What work will you do? So once again, we see them uh, the wrong focus. Mm -hmm. Here they go. Uh, our, our fathers ate the manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Now it's interesting because they, the, uh, Jesus fed, Jesus first preached to them and then he fed them. So they had a message, but their focus became the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. Now they are asking, what are you going to give us? <laughs> Moses gave bread from heaven. What are you going to give us? And Jesus said to them, in verse 32, most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the one that offers eternal life. Mm -hmm. And this is what he's offering to them. And then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. See, they're thinking in the physical again. And Jesus wants to bring them to the spiritual. Right. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. And he who believes in me shall never thirst. And this is the true reality, the reality that Jesus brings to us that, you know, if you are following Jesus, you're not going to desire the, the knowledge the world has to offer and the things of the world. And you will not thirst for knowledge outside of what Jesus offers you because you will be satisfied. Your thirst for knowledge, the true knowledge, will be quenched. And Jesus now in verse, let's go to uh, verse 37. Jesus says, oh, so, oh, sorry, let's read verse 36. But I said to you that you were... You have seen me and you do not believe. Jesus knows they do not believe. He's trying to bring them a message so that they will believe. He says to them, for, uh, I lost my place here. 37? 37. 37, thank you. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And now this powerful statement. Yeah. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. That's yes. Right. Oh, what a message to consider. Yes. He who comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. All of you, Jesus is talking to me, all of you who come to me, you will not be cast out. You will be Amen. received. Mm. You will have eternal life. And this message is for us as well. If you come to Jesus, just as you are, you will be received. You know, some people are wondering, I don't know if Jesus will receive me. I have so much sin. I don't think I am worthy to be saved. But Jesus is asking you to receive him. Mm. Isn't that marvelous? Mm -hmm. He will receive you as you are, forgive you for your Amen. sins, cleanse you completely, and give you power to live a life where you will rejoice in following Him. All that the Father gives me, I will, uh, all, again, let me read it again. And, and the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. 
uh, I have to go to verse 37. There's something, uh, verse 39. Jesus says something on verse 39, verse 40, verse 44. And I'm going to include there verse uh, 54 as well. Because we are talking about resurrection. And when we talk about resurrection, we have to understand that Jesus is the one that gives us the resurrection of life. Mm -hmm. And here in verse 39, this is the will of the Father who sent me, that all of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up mm. at the last day. Mm -hmm. If you come to Jesus, you will not be lost. Mm -hmm. Jesus says, he will raise you at the last day if you happen to die before he comes. Because we're living in the time when Jesus Christ is coming soon. And Amen. some of us that are hearing my voice may be that you will be alive and see Jesus in the clouds of heaven. But for those that may pass away, the message is, Jesus says, I will raise you up at the last day. Mm -hmm. Verse 40, interesting. Jesus not only says this once, he says it twice. And this is the will of him who sent me that everyone who sees the son and believes in him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. You can have everlasting life. Mm. This is a message that is clear in the Bible. It's presented in John 3, 16. Uh, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever mm. believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Everlasting life is what God offers. And I am glad that it is not everlasting life in the world as yeah. it is today. Mm -hmm. Who wants to live forever in a world as right. it is today? Right. Exactly. I mean, you were talking about crimes, you were talking about violence, mm -hmm. people steal, and there's all kinds of chaos in the world. Everlasting life, as it is described in Revelation 21, there is no more tear. Yes. There's no more suffering. There's no Hallelujah. death <laughs> and no more diseases, no That's more right. pain. And God will wipe away all tears from our eyes. Praise <laughs> be to God for Amen. that. Amen. And so we read 39 and 40. I have to jump to verse 44 because there it is again. A third time Jesus says, no, no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him. And the father is drawing everyone. Everyone is being drawn. Mm. But everyone... Every person has to make a choice yes. right. if you will allow yourself to be drawn. And he says, and I will again raise him up at the last day. Third time, Jesus says, I will raise him up at the last day. Mm -hmm. This idea that when you die, you go to heaven or you go to hell, it's not a biblical idea. Mm. Jesus says, I will raise you up at the last day. Yes. In fact, the Bible says in several places, it says, uh, when I come again, my reward is with me to give to every man according mm -hmm. as his life shall be. Mm. My time is telling me that I must advance to uh, verse 54 really quick. And I'm going to go back to another verse in John chapter 6. John chapter 6, verse 54. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life mm -hmm. and I will raise him up at the last day. Four times mm -hmm. Jesus says, I will raise him up at the last day. And in order for this to be a reality in your life, you must believe in Jesus and accept his gift of everlasting life. Verse 47 says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me has mm. everlasting life. Mm. Do you yeah. believe in Jesus? Amen. Mm. You have everlasting yeah. life. You can begin Amen. to live the benefits of everlast everlasting life here. But when Jesus comes, the full uh, blessing or the full benefit of everlasting life will be given unto you. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Jesus is the bread of life. And I encourage you to accept the everlasting life that Jesus offers and live through Jesus every single day of your life. Mm -hmm. Amen and amen. amen. You know, you're sitting here repeating Jesus' statement four times, he says, mm -hmm. at the last day. But there's someone out there right now saying, Oh, but the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So let's look at this. I'm Shelley Quinn. I have Wednesday's lesson at the sound of the trumpet. Open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And actually, let's just begin with verse 1. Because what happens, Paul's writings, Peter says, hey, sometimes they're kind of difficult <laughs> to understand, but people twist the scriptures to their own destruction. We always have to read in context. So let's look at Paul's context. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says, we know that if our earthly house, this tent, 
is destroyed. Okay, so now he's talking about when we're alive, our bodies are our tent. This is our earthly house. Our bodies are our tent. But if it's destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So now he's talking about a different body that we're going to have, an eternal body. Verse two, for in this, in this body, we groan, <laughs> earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. He's saying, oh, I want that immortal body that he's going to give me. Oh, I want that glorified body. And when you're in pain, that's what you want. <laughs> and then he says, but look at this verse three. He says, if indeed having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. Hmm. What? Now, now let's look at verse four. For we who are in this tent, in our earthly bodies, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, not because we want to be without our body. And he actually said, I mean, it's to be naked is what he said in verse three, but to be further clothed that mortality may be swallowed up by life. So Paul's saying right there, we have mortal bodies. We want that immortal body to be further clothed in heaven. But there's a stage of being naked. There's a stage of being unclothed. That's death when our mortal bodies are gone. And then he says this in verse six. He says, we know that while we're at home in this body, we're absent from the Lord. Well, obviously. But then in verse seven, he, he says, but we walk by faith, not by sight. And verse eight, we're confident yet well pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Mm -hmm. He is not skipping the stage of being unclothed or being naked. We have to look at this in context. And you know, it's interesting to me because we don't only look at the context of what he's writing here, but the context of all of Paul's writings. And we're going to look at a couple in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 1 Corinthians 15, because Jesus taught that at the resurrection, he said, there's, don't marvel, there's going to be a day when I return and all who are in their grave will hear my voice. Mm -hmm. And he said, mm -hmm. some come forward, the ones who've done righteous come forward to the resurrection of life. The wicked are going to come forward to the resurrection of condemnation. So when we sleep in Jesus, and Jesus taught that death is asleep. When we sleep in Jesus, that's when we're naked without a body. That's like Job who said, oh, even though my, my flesh is given over to worms, I know that that day is coming when I'll see him in the flesh. So let's look at Paul. He had been ministering in Thessalonica and he had instilled hope of Christ's second coming. But while he was gone, people came to a false conclusion that you had to remain alive till Christ returned or you're not going to get a new body. Mm. So now they're grieving those who'd fallen asleep. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13. Paul's trying to correct their misconception. He says, 1 Thessalonians 4:13. <laughs> I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. That is a metaphor used in the Bible for death because sleep's an unconscious state. When we die, the Bible says the dead know nothing. Mm -hmm. The dead can't celebrate the Lord. It says that when we die, it's like we're unconscious, we're asleep. And the next moment we're going to, when we, our eyes open up, is when we hear Christ call us from the grave. And so he says, let, don't, don't be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who fall fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Mm -hmm. There's a resurrection hope because Christ conquered death, because he resurrected. Verse 14, for 
If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. This is a basic tenet of the gospel that God's plan is that Christians are going to be resurrected mm -hmm. at that last day, right? So now let's look at uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 22. I'm kind of going, I'm weaving this in and out. 1 Corinthians 15, 2 says, as in Adam, mm -hmm. all die, even so in Christ, all who are in Christ, all shall be made alive, but each one in his order. Christ was the first fruits. Mm -hmm. We studied that last time. Afterwards, now it's talking about when our order is, when we're going to be resurrected, when we're going to be clothed further from on high. Afterward, those who are Christ at his coming. Nowhere does the Bible teach that man has an immortal soul. First Timothy 6, 16 says, God alone has immortality. He lives in an inapproachable light. Mm -hmm. You know, I was taught growing up that when you died, you went to heaven, your spirit, mm -hmm. then your breath, but then at the second coming, he came back and he's going to reunite you with your body. It's not in harmony with the remaining text. Nobody has immortality yet. First Thessalonians 4.15, Paul says, This we say to you by the word of the Lord, mm -hmm. that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. What's mm -hmm. Paul saying? Mm -hmm. He's saying that there's no advantage to being alive when Christ returns, we're not going to go into their presence before the dead do. So that tells you they're not in his presence, are they? So Paul's language, language would be meaningless if the dead were already with Christ. The Thessalonians were mourning. Remember what he's trying to do is show them that they can be comforted. Verse 16, for the Lord himself, here it is, will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God. There's nothing secret about Christ's second coming. <laughs> it's right. loud. It's visible. Right. Christ says that the heavens are going to be shaken with the power. He's going right. to east to west like lightning. He's going to dash around. Everybody, every eye will see him. So in Matthew 24, verse 30, it says, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. This is Jesus. All the tribes will mourn mm -hmm. and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He'll send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Are we to think that some people are going to sleep through this spectacular event? It's no secret. Now mm -hmm. returning to 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. <laughs> oh, I've given you whiplash. He says, Christ sends with the shout of an archangel with the sound of the trumpet. And verse 16 says, and the dead in Christ will rise first. They don't descend, they rise. Mm -hmm. And then verse 17 right. says, Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. The dead saints, the live saints, they are caught up between heaven and earth to meet Jesus in the air. And that's where we go right back to what you were talking about, Terry. Jesus said, I've gone to prepare a place for you in my father's house are many mansions and I'm coming for you again. And one last, I'll leave this one for later. <laughs> okay. I think my time's okay. up. <laughs> All right. All right. So Shelly has, has actually, uh, me and Shelly both are kind of going to set the stage for next week's lesson because we're going to be talking about, you know, difficult passages that some people use to combat some of these things that uh, we believe the Bible to clearly teach. But... <laughs> 
You know, I'm, I'm right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I'm going to read the first few words of verse 51, because that's going to kind of set us up for Thursday's lesson. By the way, my name's Ryan Day, and I have Thursday's lesson entitled, The Everlasting Encounter. And so the very first words of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51, it says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. And, uh, you know... I haven't always been a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. I grew up in, in a different faith, uh, Christian faith, but a different denomination. And, you know, in the denomination and in denominations I studied with growing up, they interpreted this differently. And then the question we're asking is, what is this mystery? Paul says, behold, I tell you a mystery. What is the mystery? Well, I was brought up to believe that this mystery was, you know, dealing with the rapture, the secret rapture in which Christ is going to come back. He's going to evacuate his people. There's going to be seven years of tribulation. And then at the end of the seven years of tribulation, there's going to be obviously the second great, uh, well, the second coming or the second advent of Christ in which he's going to appear in the clouds of heaven in his glorious manner. But, uh, and, and of course, all of this has, you know, has been, you know, the devil has really, really attacked the truth on the, of this message uh, for many, many, many years now, especially in the modern times that we live. Uh, I remember growing up, there was this popular series uh, that was written by Tim LaHaye and, and Jerry Jenkins entitled Left Behind. I mean, this was crucial and has been actually uh, very extremely influential in the Christian world today, even among the Christian minds today. And this is what I was taught growing up. I remember watching and listening to the tapes, the, the audio cassette tapes and, 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 and listening to the audio, the, the drum, dramatized audio. And they even had the VHS tapes at that time that they would put in and we would go to Sunday school and we would watch it, Sunday school. After Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, we would watch these videos. And so it was programmed and placed into my mind a series of events and how these things were going to unfold. And this, you know, the title of this lesson is The Everlasting Encounter. The encounter that they thought, you know, what it was taught to me that was that I was brought up with was that Christ is going to encounter his people at the secret silent rapture. And then, you know, the last days and the final events of Bible prophecy are going to unfold. And I just remember the thing that really got me as a child is I remember a particular scene where they're in a plane. And I, 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 was, I wasn't a Bible scholar and I'm still not a Bible scholar, but, but I, was, I was studying. I was learning as a young man and there were several texts like 1 Corinthians 14 and many other texts, excuse me, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, excuse me, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and many other texts that had come to my mind that I had read. And I just remembered as a child go, watching this scene, this plain scene where this, you know, this lady's husband had just miraculously disappeared and his clothes were laying there. And she tells the, the main character of the movie, hey, you know, could you go to the restroom and look for my husband? I think he's ran off naked. And so he looks down and he sees the clothes laying there and he's like, he's just beside himself. And then the scene cuts over to a family, a mother and father sleeping. And right there on the plane next to them where their children were supposed to be sitting, their clothes were missing. The children had vanished. And then of course, chaos erupts on this on this plane and then they end up finding out that the pilot, the main pilot had been raptured and the co-pilot was left there with no one to drive the plane. And so it was, it was just this chaotic scene. And I remember even as a young man asking myself questions, wait a second, I thought I read a scripture where Jesus comes back in all of his glory. Well, how come they didn't see, how come no one seems to have seen Christ and all of the holy angels? You know, Matthew 25 records that all of the holy angels come back with Christ in all of his glory. How come no one 37,000 feet in the air seem to have catched or caught that when, you know, Christ coming. And, and not only that, you know, as Shelley brought up, you know, Jesus is coming back with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. Right. Why didn't those people 37,000 feet in the air in that plane, why didn't they, why didn't they hear, at least hear something? You know, there's, you know, Christ coming is going to bring a resurrection and he's going to be seen. The Bible says he's gonna, every eye is going to be seen. And I remember listening to all and, and reading all these texts and they were all flooding into my mind. And even as a young man who didn't really know the Bible as well and, and, and was still studying and learning and growing, I questioned this. And a lot of it has to do with just a misunderstanding, a misinterpretation of God's word. You know, Shelly touched on a passage that I didn't know she was going to touch on. I actually had in my notes to cover <laughs> 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8, where a lot of people quote the text. We are confident 
Yes, and well pleased. This is New King James Version. And well pleased rather to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. They say, see, when, you're, when, when, when you die, you're absent from the body, your soul, your spirit floats up and you're now present with the Lord. But it's quite interesting that uh, if you read this text, and I'm just going to quote the King James Version here. It's almost the exact same words. But the King James Version says, and Paul, Paul writes, we are confident, yes, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. But nowhere in this passage does Paul say, as soon as you die, you're immediately in That's the presence right. of God. In fact, you read the scriptures and explained it so carefully and so, so wonderfully. But verse four holds the key here. Yeah. Verse four, it says here in, in 2 Corinthians chapter five, verse four, it says, for we who are in this tent, again, the body, we're groaning, being burdened by this, you know, this carnal body, this carnal life. We're burdened, notice, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed. Notice, here's the key, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. This is Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, and he's talking about mortality being swallowed up of life. Well, if it is true that when you die, you immediately are absent from this body and present in some spiritual, ghostly, transparent version of yourself up in the presence of the Lord. Well, then what did Paul actually believe in regards to when mortality would be swallowed up? The answer is found in that passage we began with at the very beginning of this lesson here, back in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Remember in 1 Corinthians 15, he starts the passage here in verse 51, or this sec section in verse 51. He says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. changed. And then some people may, may have stopped right there and they just say, Oh, I can't wait for that time when we're, we're all going to be changed. And some people say, That's at the rapture. We're going to be changed at the rapture. We're going to be taken into the glory of God and our spiritual bodies. And then ra havoc is going to just tear loose. Uh, down here on this earth for seven horrible years of tribulation. But they don't realize that they keep reading. Notice it says, but we shall all be changed when? In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. Well, what, what, what event comes with the last trump? The second coming of Jesus Christ. It goes on to say, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. Notice the dead are being raised when? At the last yes. trump, okay? Not, not before then, but at that moment. It even goes on to say, uh, for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on, Immortal. here it is, immortality. So when do we receive immortality? Not before, not at the point when we die. No, the Bible yeah. clearly teaches that we sleep in the grave unto, until the, uh, uh, either, as Brother Terry brought out, either one of two resurrections, the resurrection of life at the second coming of Christ or the resurrection of damnation a thousand years later. And so it goes on to say, so when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then, I love that word there, then, it's then, at that point, yeah. shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Yeah. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades or oh, grave, where is your victory? It is only at the point at the second coming of Jesus that we can say those words, that we can sing that song, that we can declare that victory because it's only at that point in Christ triumphing over the world by coming back and revealing himself at his second coming in a, his glorious return that we can say we are changed because of him and what he has done. In fact, I love the text in Philippians 3, verse 20 and 21. Again, speaking in the context of the second coming of Christ, uh, Paul writes in Philippians 3, verse 20 and 21, for our conversation is in heaven, from whence yes. also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm reading from the King James Version here. Who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. When does that happen? Not at some secret silent rapture. No, no, the Bible doesn't teach that. It happens at the second coming of Jesus. Jesus, Amen. where he, we are being li made likened into his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things to himself. So my friends, make no mistake when it says here that the Lord himself and the, you know, Shelley read these texts, first Thessalonians four, verse 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. You better believe it's going to happen just like that. We don't have a, 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 a we don't talk about the comings of Jesus. We talk about the second coming of Jesus and he is indeed coming very, very soon. And I love the quote that we find, beautiful, hopeful quote in Ellen G. White's writings, The Great Controversy, page 645. She says, little children, mm 
are born, are born by holy angels to their mother's arms. Friends long separated by death are united, never more to part, and with songs of gladness ascend together to the city of God. Amen. Mm, what hope it. we have. What hope we have Amen. as Christians. We're talking today about the New Testament hope. I want to give each one of you a moment to share a final thought about your day. Pastor Terry. Friends, um, today many economists, many scientists, many people who study what's going on with the earth and society, many of them agree that something big is coming. Something, there's some kind of event that is in our near future. And we're here to tell you what that event is. It is the second coming of Jesus. One day he will, as they say, split that Eastern sky and he will make his appearance. Will you be ready? Mm -hmm. Amen. In John chapter six, verse 37. Mm -hmm. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. Remember that. Come to Jesus. He will not cast you out. Amen. I just want to leave you with one scripture, Hebrews 11, verses 39 and 34. Hebrews 11 is the faith chapter. It's talking about all these saints from the Old Testament, all these saints from the New Testament, people who were martyred and uh, thrown into the Colosseums. And you know what it ends with? Listen to this, Hebrews 11, 39 through 40. All of these, mm -hmm. having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise God having provided something better for us mm -hmm. that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Mm -hmm. We're all going to be made perfect and put on immortality That's at true. the same time. Amen. Amen. And your loved ones, your dead loved ones, your friends, your family, they will not get to step through heaven's gates before you. That's why I love the text that Shelley read earlier from 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 17 and 18. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together yeah. with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus shall we always be with the Lord. Comfort one another with those words. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Ryan, Shelley, Pastor Johnny, and Pastor Terry. Thank you for your study of the word. Such hope we have. What an incredible future you have. Just open up your heart right now and say, yes, Jesus, I am a sinner in need of a savior. Would you forgive and cleanse and make me as your child? Pastor Terry references 1 Corinthians 2, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things God has prepared for those who love him. Join us next week as we study these contrary passages, lesson number nine.